Well, in the last few weeks, we have witnessed uh, a lot of things going on in this country, uh, all surrounding the virus, COVID-19. In fact, some would say that not since uh, World War II have we seen a society like ours um, being called upon to sacrifice and to do some things uh, differently. Most of you know stores have been closed, restaurants have been closed, churches are closed, and we've explored a whole new way of doing worship uh, online, which may bring all sorts of good things later. Um, we've learned about staying home. Uh, Americans like to go places. Uh, we've learned about um, social distancing. And of course, schools are closed, colleges are closed, and no sports. Uh, whatever's on TV is something that happened a year or two ago. There's not a ball game to be found. Uh, it's just kind of amazing. Even on national TV, there's been uh, the singing of Amazing Grace. There's been God talk. And so some of those things really do uh, excite me. But I guess one of the things that comes through that really excites me is the fact that people are helping one another. And that's a very Christian principle. And so we've all... Uh, realized that and of course churches have been getting into th this too helping people with food helping the elderly and so out of all of this I, I, I heard two words unity and harmony and um, Dan preached on the first three verses of Ephesians 4 and did a nice job with that and that was all about unity and harmony and I want to move from that into what I've called this morning uh, uh, as a title, The Church as Paul Saw It. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, uh, verses about 3 through 16 is what we're going to be looking at. Uh, we've had Palm Sunday, we've had Easter, and now we're going back to the series that was begun a few weeks ago uh, by Jason. So uh, I just hope that today we might... Uh, uh, get back into this wonderful text. And this particular text is one of the most outstanding I've ever seen in Scripture because of its content. Again, as Paul saw the church, and I hope it's helpful to us here uh, this morning. Someone has said that Christ is the reconciler and the church is the instrument. And so we've looked at those first three chapters of Ephesians and um, we found out what God has done through, uh, for us in salvation. And now we're into the section of Paul's letter, uh, and most of them are like this. What's going to be our response to that? And so this uh, section really does bring some great things to it. Um, how are we going to respond? Well, I hope we'll respond in worship. Uh, a little booklet that I've got that has been so fascinating, 31 Days of Praise, uh, Ruth uh, Myers, says that uh, worship has two, it's like a crown, it has two jewels in it, the jewel of praise and the jewel of thanksgiving. And I would just hope that in our worship that uh, praise and thanksgiving would always be a part of that. And so we return to this series this morning, and as, uh, again, the passage that was uh, uh, used by Dan, the third verse, I want us to never forget. I guess if, if you forgot everything else that I said this morning but verse 3, I would feel like I've accomplished something. Maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In fact, one fellow said that's the greatest church growth principle there is. And so I just have really three words for you this morning here to think about. One is unity, the other will be diversity, and the last one will be maturity. That encompasses these verses, I believe, here this morning, and I think if we can explore those together, uh, we will be better for it here uh, today. And so that first one is unity. And one of the things that is missing in church today uh, is, is this. Churches like Woodland Hills Church of Christ 
are part of a movement called the Restoration Movement. Now, you may not care about the history of that or whatever, but I hope you'll care about this. And this is one principle that is not talked about nearly at all anymore that we need to revive. And the, what it is is the unity of all believers for the purpose of world evangelism. You see, we are commissioned to win the world to Christ, and you can't do it if you're a divided body. So Paul begins here and gives us a foundation or a platform, if you like, of seven essentials that uh, are needed in every church. And if you have a Bible open there with you, let's just look for a a moment at that. As I said, verse 3 says, uh, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he says, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. He said, there is one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in you all. Well, that's quite a mouthful there this morning, but let's just take a quick look at what Paul says is the foundation of the church. He says there is one body. All those whom God has accepted into the family are part of that body. And we need to make sure that we are not making requirements of people that aren't in the Bible, but that we are making the requirements that Scripture does teach us. And so we adhere to that. There's one body, the local church. And then he says, there is one spirit. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. And, of course, Paul would say in another place, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that if you don't have the Spirit, you're not one of God's children. And so it is important for us to understand that just like the central nervous system in the body, the Holy Spirit activates the entire body of believers. So there's one body and one Spirit, and then he says there's one hope. Well, that's heaven, and that's where all of us really want to go, and we look forward to going to heaven. But have you ever thought about who else is going to be there? I guess I'd have to admit that I haven't given a lot, a lot of thought to that. Well, uh, one uh, Kenny Bowles is a fellow that uh, has taught uh, Greek and New Testament for many years. I think he's retired now from Ozark uh, Christian College, but... Uh, he writes, has written a lot of good stuff. And here's, here's what he said. I found it fascinating. You know who's going to be there? The people of the wrong color in many people's eyes. People from the wrong side of the tracks. People that are the wrong side of the old argument. <laughs> That'll affect most of us. People you never really liked and always tried to avoid. People you have never forgiven for what they did. That's rather sobering for me as I read that because, yes, there are going to, going to be those there, as one other man said, that we didn't think were there, uh, would be there, and there's others that we thought would be there that won't be there. But there is one body and one spirit and one hope, and uh, that hope is heaven and one Lord. Now, in New Testament times, this really had impact because the early Christians, largely under Roman rule, had to pledge allegiance to Jesus if they were a Christian, but they had a problem because Rome wanted the emperor to be worshipped, and so they would have to make a decision whether they were going to stay with Jesus or whether they were going to be uh, devoted to Rome. And so this idea, you can't do both, and one Lord is Jesus, and we need to remember that that's, a, that's something that we all have to do here, is to pledge our lives to Jesus Christ. And it can mean 
the face of death for people over the past few years. And, and we today in modern America have no idea of the persecution that goes on in the world around us. And then he says, one faith. Now, in Scripture, that can mean sometimes a body of doctrine, but here it is the one faith that is the uniform relationship and commitment to uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's in the list there. And uh, then, of course, uh, if the relationship is, is right, even the uh, misunderstandings that we have with each other sometime uh, won't make any difference because there's one faith and there's one baptism. These folks would have understand, <coughs> excuse me, understood that only one way. And of course, that was baptism by immersion, which is what the word actually means there. And then there's one God, uh, the God of creation, the God who put it all together is the one that uh, Paul says should be the platform for the church. So we've got these, as one man said, the seven ones. This is the foundation of the church. This is what uh, God expects of us. And again, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. So if you have the beliefs down, then there can be unity uh, by the uh, local church. But the second piece this morning that I want to bring to your attention is the word diversity. In verses 7 through 11, if you would like to follow along here as I read this this morning, he says, but to each one of us grace has been given as Christ uh, apportioned it he said, this is why it says, now he's going to quote a piece from Psalms, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. And then he asked the question, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And so he goes ahead then to say there in verse 11, it was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God till we attain the full stature of the measure of of Christ. Now, again, the church is made up of a wide variety of people. And frankly, this section of the scripture has always been about as clear as mud to me. What in the world was Paul talking about? Well, I think maybe I've got it and I'll share with you what I think that is. He's quoting a psalm which talks about a king ascending. The background of that is the conquering king <clears throat> would go to, when they finally won the battle, <clears throat> excuse me, they got into town and they went to the king that had been ruling, then he would ascend to that king and that king was to give gifts and then he would stay there and reign. Well, Paul says, no, Christ ascended, but then he descended and gave gifts to men. And that's what he talks about here when he says he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and pastors and teachers. So I, I hope that maybe helps you. It helped me because I studied that and I, I think that's what's going on here. But the church is made up of a wide variety of people. But there are leadership gifts, and that's really what he's talking about here in this section of Scripture, that within the church, and this is Paul's view of the church. This is how Paul saw the church. And he makes a big deal about unity, but he also addresses the issue of, <clears throat> of diversity. 
And of course, among the church, there, these are leadership gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. Okay, there were apostles. We're familiar with the 12 apostles. Uh, some would even say Barnabas and uh, Silas. And of course, Matthias replaced uh, Judas Iscariot. So uh, pro uh, apostles simply means one cent. In those early days of the church, the apostles went out and preached Jesus and people came to Christ. That's why we try to, in our congregation here at Woodland Hills, make a big deal about whatever Jesus and the apostles said is what we believe we are supposed to be doing. And so the apostles were one sent. And then, of course, the prophets were preachers. Some people always get hung up on the word prophet, thinking that we're talking about somebody who foretells the future. Well, there is the point of foretelling, preaching the message of Christ, and foretelling, well, the prophet knows who won't respond and who will, so maybe there's some uh, foretelling in that. But there's the apostles and prophets, and then there are evangelists. Evangelists, one people to Christ. They carried the good news of the gospel. In fact, Paul will say to young Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Some would even say that the, the evangelist wasn't just traveling. The evangelist was located. So uh, basically, uh, he, uh, located evangelist could be the same as a pastor or teacher. Uh, in some respects, and of course he ends with pastors and teachers. The pastors have the idea of a shepherd and teachers, one who communicates the truth. A, a dear friend of mine said in a sermon one time, Christianity is a teaching religion. That's why we spend so much time teaching is because that's the nature of Christianity, and we have much to share. So I think the local minister is an evangelist, or should be, is a pastor and teacher all wrapped up into one. So uh, you think about the local church again. The local church, wherever it might be, is largely a group of people who have pledged their lives to Jesus Christ. And they come together and there are others who become leaders in that congregation and I would say it would be good for every church leader to forget most everything they ever learned about worldly leadership because spiritual leadership is different. You probably can borrow a little bit but you gotta be careful. There are to be servant leaders like we're talking about here who will come together and do the work of God in leading the people to become more mature in their faith and reaching the lost for Christ. Not too long ago, I read uh, another book about Ronald Reagan. Now, this was written by a guy who had researched the spiritual side of the former president. And uh, it was very interesting and very substantiated, I believe, in that he was a part of, grew up in Dixon, Illinois, and went to the first Christian church in Dixon. His mother taught the ladies' Bible class many times in her own home, so Reagan would sit on the steps going to the upstairs, listen to mom teach the Bible. Now, most everybody knows that Reagan's dad was an alcoholic, which usually brings a lot of baggage and dysfunction. But Reagan, evidently, according to this author, was greatly influenced by the men of the First Christian Church in Dixon, Illinois. In fact, it is substantiated that he had given quite a bit of thought to going into the ministry. But as I read all of that about him, and I'd read a lot of other things about him, but this was really good because this was home, this was church, and um, it was interesting that in spite of some things that could have been great 
uh, detriments in his life, these men of the local church in Dixon, Illinois, influenced a young man who became a world leader and had even thought about ministry. And that is, to me, what we should have as the ideal today in every church is that we have that kind of nurturing and caring for every member of the church. So there is unity, there is diversity, as Paul saw, but the last thing is maybe the most important, and that is maturity. And look at verses 14 through 16. He says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. He says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The thing we want to have happen is for people to come to Christ and grow up and mature in Christ. And I would challenge you with this. When a newborn baby or a baby begins to grow, and maybe even gets to six months, and that baby doesn't appear to be growing, we're off to the doctor immediately. There's something wrong. We got to find out why this baby is not growing. And I would ask you the question, why don't we do the same with baby Christians? They need the same attention. And if they're not growing, then leadership and membership needs to be trying to help them find out why they aren't growing and see what we can do to nurture them again. But see, sometimes in that nurturing, that might even mean encouraging, but it might also mean correcting. All those things are important. And then verse 15 says, but how we do it, Speaking the truth in love. I want you to remember verse 15. It is key. When I was young, there was the speaking of, of a lot of truth. I'm not quite as certain about the love that was supposed to come with that. Today we see a lot of love, and I'm not sure we're speaking the truth as we should. Why can't we get it right from Paul? Speaking the truth in love. We you see, the body grows and functions, and the body of Christ needs to do the same thing. And so this morning in this passage of Scripture, there's a whole lot that can be said. I think it, it is really a huge piece of steak that takes lots and lots of chewing and enjoying because it really, Paul's view of the church boils down to the fact of unity and diversity and maturity. And so the local church is still the instrument that God wants it to be. It is the body of Christ here on earth. And I just hope that we can minister in the church together for the cause of Christ, but too many times we get sidetracked. The local church gets inbred. It has people that are disagreeing and they're fighting and there's trivial opinions being expressed. So we could go on and on and on. But I just want to call us to a higher plane to speak the truth in love, to nurture, to correct, and to bring us together into a growing congregation. Let me reflect about my own life, and we'll bring this to a close uh, today. I, I've, I think about this. Uh, it's close to being 60 years ago uh, since I made a confession of faith and was baptized into Christ. Now, I went to church all of my life. 
I was brought to church as an infant, and uh, my parents were in heavily involved in the church. And I, it was at church that I got challenged that maybe I could go into ministry. It was at church where I saw a, a good example and I saw a bad example. It was in church where I was encouraged, but there's also some times that I could tell you that where I felt like I was greatly uh, discouraged and not uh, helped in any way, but it was through the local church that I came to Christ and I went my way, and I am eternally grateful for that. I want to challenge you this morning to do your part to be the one who would lift people up and make the local church the most attractive thing in the community. And Paul here in these 17 verses gives us something to really think upon today. And so as we get ready for our time of invitation here this morning, Paul's view of the church, I hope it will ring in your ears and be a part of your life. But if you haven't come to Christ and made a confession of faith, been baptized, <clears throat> we'd urge you to do that. Jason's going to come and receive uh, people in terms of their thinking, and uh, you, you can talk with him about that in some other venue, but this morning, let's think about that as we close the service today, because we want to be a congregation that is speaking the truth in love.